Hi, I'm Tim. Welcome to our channel and thanks for logging on. By popular demand, it's come to this. Undefeated in versus comparisons, the 2018 25th anniversary Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter, an indomitable competitor, meets its match, the Blancpain 50 Fathoms Bathyscaphe. Or does it? We've got what should be a no comparison test between high horology and luxury horology. Let the games begin. Omega. As the defender of its turf and the reigning champion, we'll go first. This is the Seamaster Professional Diver 300 meter, launched in 1993, completely redesigned for 2018, the highlights being a new dial in ceramic, a 42 millimeter case over the 41 predecessor, and an all new movement caliber 8800 with display case back. Stainless steel, the watch is easy to wear. I'm gonna show it to you on my wrist. My wrist is 16 centimeters in circumference, and you can see it's an easy watch to wear. 42 millimeters in diameter, but a friendly 42. It's nicely proportioned and also nicely sized at 50 millimeters lug to lug. I wear it easily. I can recommend it for a wrist as small as 14 centimeters in circumference. Its thickness is manageable, 13.7, and its strap width is nicely matched to the size of the case. It's 20 millimeters, so you'll have a world of OEM and aftermarket strap options. The timepiece also has a broader, flatter look, though it's grown a little thicker since its previous version. The fact that it does have a larger case means that it looks proportionally just as elegant. The strap is a hand piece and it was designed for this generation of the watch. It's vulcanized rubber and you can see it features double striations with a sort of satin finish and then there's a matte grain to the remainder. The underside featuring waves that evoke both the arabesque Cote de Genève on the movement and the laser etched ceramic dial. Jumping out to the buckle you can see it was also custom designed for this watch and this generation of the Seamaster Diver 300 meter. A combination of both polish and satin and look at that relieved raised and polished logo on a satin finished base. Things like that zing me. Now jumping back to the case, it's familiar, you guys know it. This basic case form has been in use on Speedmaster and Seamaster Pros since the 1960s. Helium escape valve reprofiled for 2018 in a conical form. It can now be opened while submerged. So if you're a saturation diver and you just plumb forgot to open the escape valve, well, submerged, you can now open it. The bezel is a broad blue ceramic insert with white enamel inlays. You can hear the detent is quite crisp, though the knurling's a bit shallow. The dial is ceramic, which gives you all the advantages of enamel. It won't tarnish, it won't oxidize, it won't fade, but none of the fragility or expense of enamel. All applique indices. You can see the classic Bond-style Seamaster skeleton hands. And yes, this watch is in the tradition of the great Pierce Brosnan Seamaster Diver 300 meter Bond watch. This is the continuation of that series. You can see there is now a date at six o'clock rather than three. Turn it all over, caliber 8800, nicely executed. You can see it's the latest tri-level coaxial, so the most advanced technology Omega has for a consumer product. They make everything in the swatch group from the stones to the lubricants to the shock protection, so highly integrated just as much as the Blancpain, which is a patrician from the same swatch group. Now, 300 meters water resistant, this watch is the business, and you could easily wear it as your everyday office companion. So let's talk about the Challenger. The Omega's Bona fides are well established. The Bathyscaphe, though launched in 2013, still feels like a little bit of an upstart, though it's the patrician upstart in this competition. 25 years of that Seamaster Diver 300 make this the watch with something to prove. So let's talk about how it does this. The watch is big, 43 millimeters in diameter, and yet it doesn't seem substantially larger than the Omega on the wrist. A couple of reasons for that. Though it's a 43 compared to a 42, and we'll zoom out a little bit more so you can see it in proportion. Nevertheless, from lug to lug, it's stubby. It's only 49.7 millimeters, so the watches are almost the same distance lug to lug. I recommend them both for 14 centimeter or larger wrists. Also, if you look at the watch in profile, though it doesn't have the sloped sides of the Omega, nevertheless, it is thinner. The Omega's 13.7, this is 13.4. One element element of this vintage inspired design that feels very contemporary is the spacing of the lugs which is 23 millimeters exceptionally broad though the watch has 1970s cues on its dial side nevertheless it does have the stance and the footing of a modern oversized sports watch both watches are stainless steel and this one's fitted with a sailcloth strap a long time signature of the 50 fathoms starting with the old 5015 this one is olive drab military green bolstered down its center it has a 
folded edge and a monotone stitch, but there's an underlay of wonderfully supple rubber. So you get the strength of the sailcloth, but you don't get the textile coarseness against the skin. The buckle is a handsome piece, though it's not quite as elaborate as the Omegas. It is just as well branded and handsomely executed. It's sharp, even a little bit severe, just like the watch itself. There's not a whole lot of nuance to this case. It's designed in the image of a minimally beveled 1960s or 70s original. Of course, that the root of the Bathyscaphe name in the 50 Fathoms collection. You can see that the ends are squared off rather than tapered as on the Omega. There's no high polish on this watch. Everything is of satin finish. And the looks themselves are simple but strong. On the crown side, there's no crown guard. Again, vintage inspired. You can see Blancpain went with a big crown look. It's very effective in that it's an easier crown to grip with wet, sweaty, or gloved hands, and the knurling is sharper and deeper than what you find on the Omega, so it's quite easy to dislodge this one even when it's screwed down in its entirety. Now, on the dial side, you can see there is a bezel. The bezel knurling is far easier to grip than the Omega, but the action itself doesn't feel or sound quite as crisp. It's good, the Omega just feels a little bit more precise. Like the Omega, you have a ceramic bezel, or at least a ceramic bezel insert. Unlike the Omega, rather than the enamel inlay, you have a liquid metal, which is a metal that is co-molded to the ceramic such that they can never separate even under impact. The dial is a bit more traditional than the Omega with applique indices, and you can see that the hands at center are an exaggerated needle tip baton characteristic of watches you would have seen in the late 60s and early 70s. In the 50 Fathoms Bathyscaphe collection, there's a bob-style counterweighted red varnished seconds hand, and the dial rather than the ceramic on the Omega is a handsome anthracite sunburst. There is a more traditional black, but I would say the anthracite is more distinctive of the modern Bathyscaphe. In contrast to the Omega, rather than replacing one of the indices with the date, the date sits between 4 and 5. Turn it all over and you can see this is a special movement. Exactly the same caliber you would find in in the standard 5015 50 fathoms. This is the caliber 1315. Automatic winding five day power reserve. It has a blackened and frosted, alternately satin and frosted, 18 karat gold winding mass, three main spring barrels. Free sprung for shock resistance with a silicon hairspring. One feature of this movement that you will not find on the Omega is the hand finishing. You can see the mirrored chamfer of this caliber. And you can see at the edge of each bridge, it is large, fat, rounded, optically smooth, and done by hand. This is not a mechanically finished movement. Each screw head is black polished by hand. And there's a satin graining that's applied against a buffing machine across all of the bridges. It's not Cote de Genève. It's more of a satin as you would see on for example, the case flank. It's that kind of finish. It's handsome, it's muted, and it's appropriate to a sports watch. And this movement, though not a Matas chronometer or a certified chronometer like the Omega, nevertheless adjusted in six positions, and these have been proven in practice to run to one second a day. So this watch, beautifully handmade on the inside, sharp, stout, and rather stripped down on the outside. So let's talk about advantages, the Omega first. Well, let's start with the obvious, price. These two watches live in entirely different price strata. The Omega is a watch that sells, as you see it on the strap, for $4,750. Pony up an extra $100, you get it on the full bracelet with the deployant clasp and the multiple degrees of adjustment. So $4,750, you buy this watch pre-owned on the strap, you're going to pay from $3,000 to $3,500. That's considerably less than the $10,500 you'd pay new for the Bathyscaphe, or if you were purchasing the Bathyscaphe, Gaff pre owned seven to seven and a half thousand. So, price advantage Omega. Warranty advantage Omega. The Bathus Gaff comes with a two year standard warranty from Blancpain, and if you buy it at a Blancpain dealer, you can register it with them and get an extra year for three years of coverage. But Omega, standard, regardless of what dealer you buy it from, as long as it's an authorized dealer, you're getting five years of coverage. Second, I would mention that this bezel, though it doesn't have a better knurling and it's harder to grip by a considerable margin, it has a better sound and a better feeling detent. It simply feels and sounds more precise. Advantage on that front, Omega. Let's talk about the full balance bridge. This is something that needs to be shouted out. Both of these watches feature a free sprung index for shock resistance, but only the Omega features a double anchored balance bridge with flanking supports on both sides of the balance. And the Omega features the coaxial, which is an interesting technological feather in its cap. Though remember, this basic 8800 version only features a single mainspring barrel. 
So it's not quite as stable from day to day and after 24 hours in terms of amplitude as the Blancpain. But with the full bridge and the coax, it's both a little bit tougher and a bit more technically sophisticated. Let's talk about the fact that this is a timepiece with a timeless style that has never gone out of production. It's not a retro re-edition in the same sense that the Blancpain is a little bit of a re-edition of a vintage Blancpain bathyscaph. This is a timepiece that stands on its own four lugs as a product of the modern era that has never fallen out of favor, never been discontinued, so advantage Omega. And if you dig the 007 connection, and I have to admit I'm a victim of marketing, I think it's cool, then this watch is the modern choice of James Bond, and it is fun to see your watch on screen. Jumping to the Blancpain, let's talk about what this watch has objectively over the Omega. This is a watch with rarity and exclusivity. Blancpain today makes somewhere between 7,500 and 15,000 watches a year. Omega makes hundreds of thousands. And you have to break that production at Blancpain up over several different model lines and many different models. So this is a watch you will rarely see, and you certainly won't see another one around the officer club. Let's talk about the 120 hour five day power reserve. Let's talk about the use of three barrels in this movement. Those features allow the caliber to be far more stable after 24 or 48 hours, whereas the Omega will lose significant amplitude, this watch will not, largely due to the three barrels. So the three barrels give you stability, but they also give you longevity. 55 hour power reserve in the Omega, 120 hours in the Bathyscaphe Advantage Blancpain. Let's talk about the grip and the knurling on the side of the bezel. It's far better on this watch. When you're using a dive style watch in the real world, even if you're just using it on a day you might be a little bit sweaty, it's tough to grip the Omega's bezel. This is relatively fine and sharp. You can dig your fingers into it and easily turn it. So the feel and the detent are not as nice as the Omega, but from a practicality standpoint, it's much easier to grip this bezel. Let's talk about far superior movement finish, no context. From the rotor to the bridges to the plate to the screws, everything here speaks to the high horology origins of this movement. It was originally the manual wind 13RO designed for flagship Le Brasseau Blancpain collection watches. The Le Brasseau collection is the top of the heap and the 13RO is a legend. This is the automatic adaptation of that with absolutely no diminution of finishing quality. This can stand toe to toe with the likes of the best Jager Le Coult, Vacheron or Patek Philippe. Now the timepiece externally is a bit more simplified and stripped down and some will find that to be an advantage in particular the fact that the watch features no crown guard which makes it practically easier to use this crown and the fact that there isn't quite as much flamboyance among the all satin finished surfaces of the case so in terms of muted low key finish the Blancpain is the patrician but it looks a little bit more like a vernacular timepiece I'll also mention that the watch features a superior nighttime luminescence and that by far you'll see this at the end of the video but by night it's just a heck of a lot easier to see the Blancpain watch so advantage Bathyscaphe. I will also mention that it seems as though the dial is a bit more refined. Many like the new laser etched ceramic on the Omega, but there has been a vocal contingent that finds it to be a bit overblown and gimmicky, especially in color, whereas the dial of the Bathyscaphe is a handsome traditional sunburst with glorious applique indices and old style high polished baton hands. It's a bit understated, it's more traditional, but it does speak to the luxury intent of the watch. It's discreet enough to be used as a dress timepiece. So which of these two do I prefer? Well, I happen to love everything the Omega represents, and I'm an owner of the original Bond Seamaster Diver 300 from the early 2000s, late 90s. That's a great watch. This is a timeless classic, and as a current owner, I can't say anything disparaging about the latest model. It's an upgrade in every way, technically, aesthetically, and materially. But the Bathyscaphe is true high horology. It's a way you can pay less than $8,000 pre-owned to get into the class of watches that includes the likes of Audemars Piguet Royal Oaks, Patek Philippe Aquanauts, and Nautili. This is a timepiece that looks inside and out as though it were finished as a high horology dress watch, but with the durability and versatility to be your high horology sports watch. I like the extraordinary power reserve. I like the muted tones of the dial and the handsome liquid metal inlays of the bezel. I like the stripped down all satin case. I like the compact fit of the slender case on the wrist and the oversized no guard crown. With the pedigree to match its lineage as a Blancpain 
flagship piece. This is my choice. It's just the more capable watch. It's a lot more watch for a lot more money. So does that count as the first defeat for the Diver 300 meter? Depends on how you see it. As a value proposition, it remains unrivaled. But if you believe that sometimes more is more, then the Bathyscaf has to be the victor in this competition. Diver 300 meter, Bathyscaf. Diver 300 meter, Bathyscaf. I just find the Blancpain a little bit easier to read.